So when I say Yu-Gi-Oh! video game, what pops into your head? Probably just a simulator, right? Playing just a bot, other people, and uh, gambling. Uh, there was an era where Yu-Gi-Oh! games were far more experimental, when the card games was in its first steps of existence. A time where they completely missed the landing and made a horrid beast known only as Yu-Gi-Oh! Forbidden Memories. This game is infamous for being extremely unfair, incredibly grindy, and weirdly enough having a genuinely good soundtrack. So let's say, for some reason, you actually wanted to play this game. You would first want to know how to actually play it. When you look at the board, this pretty much just looks like Yu-Gi-Oh! There are several differences that make it an entirely separate experience. So, first things off the bat, you can only have 5 cards up to your hand, and every turn you draw up to 5 cards, which Konami would shamelessly steal in the Rush Tool format. Each turn you can only play one monster or one spell or trap card. You can also play monsters in the fabled face-up defense position, though kinda not really, you can put it in face-up attack position and then change it to face-up defense position on the same turn. There's also this really cool and irrelevant mechanic called Guardian Sign. So whenever you play a monster, you can select one of two Guardian Signs, and each Guardian Sign is good against one sign and bad against another sign. So whenever a monster battles a sign that it's good against, it gains 500 attack or defense, depending if it's on attack or defense position. There's like 12 signs, I think 10 actually, so it never comes up. So it really doesn't matter, like 80% of the time. But it's something, it's in the game. You also are required to play a card before passing your turn, which means you're always going to be drawing a card, even if you have five cards in your hand. But probably what this game is most infamous for, gameplay-wise, is the ability to initiate fusion from your hand with any number of monsters. While this kind of sounds like a crazy feature at face value, it was definitely practically impossible to bribe fusion for every card, so your fusion result mainly depends on the type of its monster, its amount of attack points, and its gender, weirdly enough. Though because this game sucks, it doesn't tell you about any of the fusions you can make, record any of them in some sort of guide, or otherwise guide you into creating fusions in any way. You sort of just have to commit it all to memory, or you can use this godsendable website that I'm going to put in the description if you want to play this game. I don't know why, man. Uh, that automatically calculates all possible fusions, which is super helpful. Also, you can fuse spell and trap cards to create other spells or traps, which is like the coolest concept ever in my opinion, but it's not really useful, mostly because you don't get any spells or trap cards, and most of them are kind of samey, so there's not too much reason to do it. But it's nice that it's here, it's a cool concept at least. So when I said that fusions were the most infamous game mechanic here, I was kind of lying and not lying. It's the most infamous game mechanic, but the most infamous thing regarding this game is probably its obscene difficulty. So if I were to put a gun to your head and force you to guess if the game is hard because of the opponent's intricately designed decks or you have to make the most of the limited tools you have available to build a deck that counters it, or would you... Nah, I'm just fucking with you. They just throw big numbers at you, and the chances of you getting a card that even encroaches on the power of the cards that your opponents will consistently have access to are slim to none if you're not using any sort of RNG manipulation, which I certainly didn't, because I didn't know how. Uh, even after doing a substantial amount of grinding, you might just not have the options. Also, the AI just straight up cheats uh, in some of the later fights, getting a comedic 20 cards in their hand. You only see 5, but they're in fact 20 cards, which is very fair. They can also just see through any set card that you play, not that you're really going to be doing a lot of that in the later game. So the game is completely unfair, but you know, that's not really that bad if you have multiple ways of tackling it changed up your strategy. Though there's always going to be one that's the most consistent, if you have the ability to change up the way you play the game, essentially, and you still have a chance of winning, uh, you know, it might not be that bad. Though another one of the most iconic pieces of this game is the most effective strategy available. The legendary Twin-Headed Thunder Dragon with 2,800 attack created by combining a thunder with a dragon with either piece having over 1,500 attack. Uh, I also noticed that dinosaurs with 1,500 attack also worked, so yeah. So Twin-Headed has the second highest attack out of any fusion monster in the game, only beaten by Meteor Black Dragon, which you need a Meteor Dragon and a Red-Eyes Black Dragon for, and I don't think you're getting either of them, let alone both. And when you compare the two requirements for fusions, making Twin-Headed is just infinitely easier. So if you're not insane, it is your bar none best option to deal with the game's fun level of difficulty. 
So you generally just stack dragons and thunders and equip cards that can buff Twin Headed. The closest the game gets to actually having an engaging setup are the field mages, Sebek and Neku, I think, where they all have their respective terrain already set up on the field, giving their monsters a power bonus. So you could also bring monsters of that type or try to override it with other field spells. It's not like that much, but it's something at the very least. Despite the massive amount of hate I'm giving this game, it does get a few things right, some things actually really right. Probably the most notable is the game's music, which is actually very good. If you're at all familiar with Forbidden Memories, you probably know the Free Jewel theme, which is awesome. But there are some really neat ambient tracks here as well, and plenty of great battle themes. It legitimately holds up despite being on the PS1. Also, the game has 3D models for every single monster, and while I couldn't find an exact number, and I'm definitely not counting, there are 722 cards in the game, and most of them are monsters. You can view a little animated battle by hitting triangle when going to battle a monster, and when they're like really drawn out, it's fun to watch the first time around to see the, what they came up with the models. I think the most surprising good aspect of this game is that it has a weirdly good sense of atmosphere. Well, in the Egypt section, in the first part of the game you just go through a bland tournament before being able to travel back in time to ancient Egypt. There's some sort of issue with my emulator or my ROM or something because it would just loop the first few seconds of the music over and over, so I just muted the whole game. As a result, the dismal creepy atmosphere, abandoned buildings, combined with the absence of any sound, was really effective at building a dark atmosphere. Though I can imagine it with sound would probably have been freaky regardless. The biggest tragedy of Forbidden Memories for me is that I was generally pretty close to being a really fun, unique experience. Legitimately good, maybe not, but there's a lot of unique elements that make it different from any other Yu-Gi-Oh game that you can play. It just happens to completely fumble them. They have the fusion mechanic, but without effect monsters, your options are really just boiled down to what is the biggest number. Most of the enemies don't have much going on besides just big number either, and the drops being completely random and rare at the time just ended up being a poorly designed RNG game of war that's just really unfortunate. Though there's part of me that likes it the way it is, the raw malice of the game devs imbued in it as it puts you through hell just to beat a licensed Yu-Gi-Oh game is kind of awesome, it's legitimately really endearing, and if I had the opportunity, uh, well I probably would change it, I would definitely have to think about it, cause it's pretty cool the way it is. Thanks for watching, do the YouTube things, uh, goodbye, see ya.